All of us want to live in our homes for as long as possible. Tonight on The Best Times, we examine the progress of the Plough Foundation's Aging in Place initiative. And we'll tell you why you gain weight as you age and how you can lose it. Funding for The Best Times is provided by The Plow Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you. Hello, I'm Chris Hardaway. Welcome to this edition of The Best Times, a series that looks at life after 50. In a 2012 survey by the Plow Foundation, 94% of Shelby County seniors said they wanted to live in their homes for as long as possible. And why not? Like Dorothy said, there's no place like home. Yet census surveys report that nearly half of their respondents felt that their homes would only somewhat meet their needs as they got older. Take a look at your house. How many steps lead up to your front door? As we age, those steps can become a barrier instead of an entranceway. The answer to eliminating those barriers is something called universal design. It's a set of architectural principles that allows universal access to homes and buildings, which means that our homes can adapt to our needs as we age. For the past four years, a grant from the Plow Foundation has funded efforts to make modifications to homes owned by low-income seniors in Shelby County so that they can live in place for as long as possible. Tonight, we examine the success of the Aging in Place initiative. In 2015, the Plow Foundation issued a major grant to several local agencies led by Habitat for Humanity to reach out to low-income seniors in Shelby County who need home modifications to enable them to age in place. Habitat volunteers, led by supervisors from MLGW, have built dozens of ramps across the county for low-income seniors who need them for access to their homes. Some home modifications were simple, grab bars in the bathroom or new tile to replace peeling linoleum. But grab bars in the bathroom aren't enough when the bathtub is falling through the floor. Contractors have made major repairs to roofs, floors, bathrooms, and kitchens. The average job cost is $13,000. Research by the Plow Foundation identified almost 8,000 homes in Shelby County needing some sort of aging in place modification. With the grant money leveraged by additional funds, Habitat and their partners will be able to serve only about 350 seniors. Habitat for Humanity's mission is building homes for low-income residents. Every new home they build incorporates universal design principles, such as zero-step entries and wider doorways, to ensure the new owners can age in place. To take a more in-depth look at universal design and to update the progress of the Plow Foundation's Aging in Place initiative, I sat down with Dwayne Spencer, President and CEO of Habitat for Humanity of Greater Memphis, the lead agency in the Plow Foundation's Aging in Place initiative. Before we talk about uh, the Aging in Place initiative and update things in this final year, I, I want to step back and talk about the concept of aging in place. Uh, what, is, what is the value of it? Why is it important that aging in place matters to Memphis or Shelby County or even the country? Yeah, well first the concept. Aging in place is about uh, creating an opportunity for seniors to remain in their home for as long as they want to for the rest of their lives and most people want to be able to do that, most seniors. Um, I think the, the other side of it is uh, the opportunity to make improvements to homes 
um, that have a major impact on communities and neighborhoods, and we keep the older citizens, um, sort of the folks who watch out over the neighborhoods in their houses. Um, that's sort of certainly a positive aspect of it. And then um, in the long term, the, the long term savings to um, MCOs and Medicare and, and insurers, if we can invest a small amount of money into a repair uh, that keeps the senior from going to long term care, um, which is very costly to all of us as citizens because the government um, pays the bulk of that cost. Do you have any numbers to reflect just what you said about the savings well, involved? Uh, one estimate puts the cost of uh, nursing home care uh, for a senior for one year at about seventy to seventy nine thousand dollars a year. So we're talking about interventions that average about ten to fifteen thousand dollars, saving you know eighty thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. You multiply that uh, times twenty families, and you've saved one point eight million dollars. Um, and we've served nearly 400 seniors just in Shelby County alone. Let's go back four years yeah. to the beginning of, of this initiative when the Plow Foundation uh, uh, initiated the grant, right. which began this. What, looking at it from four years ago, what were the challenges you thought you were going to face? Identifying the families and uh, you know the affordability of the projects. You know, we went into uh, the, the grant process with the Plow Foundation estimating the cost, the average cost of the intervention being around uh, $6,500. Um, but we quickly learned after we got out in the field with our construction team uh, that really, um, because so many of the houses needed roof repair, um, major plumbing issues, that the cost was more like twelve dollars to $13,000 per, per unit. So that made the job much bigger than you expected. It did. We actually had to go back to the Plow Foundation and ask if we could, uh, you know, uh, reduce the number of interventions from 500 as we originally uh, projected down to about 350. And they were gracious enough to allow us to do that. Um, let's talk about a couple of numbers. Uh, yeah. the numbers of people you've been able to serve up to this point and then the average cost of these renovations. You mentioned it a little bit earlier. Yeah, so we've done about 380 interventions for seniors here in Shelby County and uh, the average cost per intervention is $12,700. Which is twice what you expected going into it That's originally. Right. That's right. Simply because of the state of these older homes? Correct. And, yes. and and the homeowners, since they're low income, inability to repair them? The majority of uh, our clients had not made any sort of home improvements ever to their homes, about 50% of them. Uh, and they are also living in uh, the loop, as we call it, in the sort of inner city, in homes that are 80 to 90 years old. Um, and so uh, the, the wear and tear was, was significant. And some of the homes I read about were so in such bad shape you couldn't really serve them at all because it would have been too Yeah, expensive. those are the heartbreaking stories um, that our uh, construction team goes out and uh, does a physical assessment and determines that uh, the cost of the intervention would be more than the actual value of the house. And so when that happens, we, we have to turn it down. And typical renovations, what would be a typical renovation that you did? I would say probably 80, 85% of the homes need a new roof. And that many? that many and our construction team calls it getting it in the dry you know we we can't put um, a handrail in a wall that has rotted wood right and so that means you know if it, the wood is rotted then the cost of that project increases so now the plow foundation initially in their initial research identified almost 8,000 right uh, homes in the memphis and shelby county area that needed help yes you've been able to serve just a small portion of that um, the need is great, so what happens in the future? Because this, <laughs> this is the last year of the plow funding. Correct? It is. We are trying to use all of the research and data uh, that we've collected. Um, we interview our clients every uh, three months um, after the intervention, then one year, and then three years after the intervention. And uh, we are collecting economic uh, data as well as social data about the um, impact on the individual's life as well as um, sort of estimated cost savings that we can then take to um, uh, MCOs and the likes, TenCare, um, those sort of organizations and, and argue 
um, for, uh, I guess it's an advocacy argument to uh, change policy about how dollars are spent from uh, some of these agencies to assist seniors. And so we want to um, take our data and, and say, look, for the, you know, a $10,000 intervention, you can save hundreds of thousand dollars over the lifespan of keeping a senior out of a nursing home or from going to the emergency room on a, re on a repeated basis. Well, those are the numbers, but uh, this program, in the end, it's all about the people, the homeowners. It is. And I'm interested to hear if you've had any feedback, what the feedback is from the homeowners. Is it, is it changing their lives? It really is. Uh, one of the things that really hits home is the socialization aspect. Uh, many of the, the, the uh, seniors would not have visitors or guests or even their grandchildren over um, because of you know, holes in the floor or uh, a hole in the ceiling. Um, hoarding is a huge issue. And um, our ability to, to go in and do these modifications and, and uh, give them um, more pride um, in their home and, and comfort to invite people in. And uh, it's a beautiful thing to see. Now, big picture, we know that uh, America is aging. Yes. That in not too, in the not too distant future, 20% of our population will be over age 65. That's right. That's certainly gonna hold true for Memphis and Shelby County. So what does the future hold in terms of this, this issue as a whole? Um, every year, um, Hab Habitat goes to Washington and advocates for um, affordable housing issues. We now have to start having a conversation about um, the aging population and what it's going to take um, to keep families in their homes longer. And it really comes down to money which is why it's very important for us to take our data and, 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 and share it with the folks who have the influence and have the dollars that are being used to house seniors um, in, in nursing homes, et cetera, and, and, and encourage them to use the dollars in a more um, innovative, proactive way rather than reactive. Finally, what advice would you give viewers who are in their homes, regardless of their economic level? Uh, yeah about adapting their homes, making them, turning them to, into ageless homes? Well, uh, it may be surprising, but um, make sure you have a bathroom on the first floor. Um, as we get older, climbing stairs is a, is, is a big issue. Um, make sure that you, know, you have doors that are at least 32 inches wide um, so that if you ever have to, to be in a wheelchair that you can get in. Um, lever handles on, on many of the doors in the household make them uh, much easier to open. Um, those sort of things, non-slip floors, um, watch out, watching out for carpet um, uh, where they kind of, it kind of sticks up on the end and you can trip over it, so trip hazards. And then lighting, I don't think people really think about that. You know, you're walking down a hallway um, that needs better lighting, just brighten the space up some. So those sort of things. All right, well, thank you for being on The Best Times talking about aging in place. Yeah, thank you, Chris. When you hit your 50s and 60s, you may have noticed that you gained weight. Now, it may seem like putting on a few pounds is an inevitable part of aging, but it's not. However, you are more susceptible to gaining weight after age 50 due to a variety of reasons. And sadly, it becomes harder to lose that weight as our age increases. But don't panic. Tonight on The Best Times, we investigate the practical science behind losing weight after 50. So many people that I know, men and women, not just women, uh, they say it's so difficult for them to lose weight in their 50s and 60s. They've gained this weight and they don't understand why. Is weight gain an inevitable part of the aging process? Not necessarily. Um, if you maintain your level of activity and maybe even do a little bit more, you are able to stave off that weight gain. But particularly for women, as their estrogen levels go down with menopause, they do tend to get hungrier and their metabolic rate does tend to go down. And metabolic rate, the primary driver of that is your muscle mass. Well, let's talk about the gender differences. Sure. Because you just mentioned women and, mm -hmm. and the hormones. Uh, women seem to have a tougher time 
losing weight. They gain it, seem to gain it quicker, and they have trouble losing it. Uh, why? What's the difference between men and women when it comes to losing weight beyond 50? Well, there is that hormonal difference, um, like I mentioned. There's also, we find that perhaps because women have had so many weight loss attempts over their life, that when I see men that start to engage in a weight management program, most of it's new to them and they get so mm -hmm. enthusiastic and they're really <laughs> motivated and we find that they are more likely to engage in some of the behaviors that we know that are related to weight loss, like keeping track of their diet and their physical activity. And so we, we know that men tend to do that more and men often get these great weight losses, particularly early on in the programs. Now, I I know from my research, as we age, our metabolism slows, we lose muscle mass. Why, what causes our metabolism to slow and can we do anything about it? As we age, we are gonna have about an 8% drop in our metabolic rate and in our muscle mass per decade. So obviously by the time we hit 50 and 60, that drop is gonna manifest itself in a lower need for calories. Um, if we don't adjust that to where we actually are taking in fewer calories, if we keep eating the way we've been eating, then we will gain weight. And um, men have more muscle mass than women. So they're gonna start out at a kind of an a advantage in that they can use that muscle mass to help them drive that metabolism and stay on track with their weight loss efforts. Yeah, someone, I don't remember whether you said this or not, but in controlling metabolism, you actually can control it through exercise? Um, you can influence it through exercise. If you can gain muscle mass, then you're going to increase your metabolic rate. And how do I gain muscle mass? Don't I exercise, of course, but how? Yes, <laughs> exercise. Um, typically, we would recommend uh, resistance training. Obviously, in an older population, we want to uh, use caution and work with some experienced trainers so that you're not uh, putting someone at risk for injury. Um, but including a strength training, weight lifting kinds of activities two days a week would be uh, recommended for most people. And that's to, to build the muscle mass. Mm -hmm. What about the yes, burning calories to, part? Okay, so as you build the muscle mass, hopefully you're going to also have an increase in um, and the need for calories and the way that your body responds to that. Typically, to, to actually burn the calories, we're gonna recommend aerobic activities, so walking, jogging, swimming, biking, any, any sort dancing, of aerobic cardiovascular anything that's exercise. using large muscle groups for a continuous amount of time. Um, the key on this is to do the long time, though. So if you're wanting to lose, well, if you're wanting just for good health, we recommend about 30 minutes each session, um, most days of the week. If you want to lose weight, we're saying 60 minutes, so that's an hour a day, most days of the week. That sounds like a lot. Um, it gets even better. To maintain that weight loss, you want 90 minutes <laughs> oh. a day. So this is hard so you work. Need to Losing move. weight is hard work, is what you're telling me. Um, you need to move. I, I don't know, it, you know, I hate to use the word work. <laughs> <laughs> so you wanna make sure that it's yeah. something that you enjoy. So, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So you do want to think about which of these activities might I like the best? Am I the kind of person that likes to do the same kind of thing? And maybe I love to watch something on, sh on some sort of show or listen to a podcast while I do it to make it even more enjoyable. Or maybe I'm the kind of person that really likes variety. And so I bike one day and I swim the next day and then I walk the next day. Um, so you have to figure out what works for you, what kind of person you are so that it is something that is at least a little bit enjoyable, that it's not perceived as this, this burden, and it, it can be a fun part of your lifestyle. Let's talk about diet, food, for mm -hmm. example. What food should we be eating after age 50 and 60 to help us lose that weight? Um, how do we control our portions? How do we change our behavior in that respect? So you typically want to choose foods that are high in water content um, because that will fill you up for fewer calories. You can also choose foods that are high in fiber content, so fruits and vegetables. You can also choose foods that are high in air content. So those are the things that kind of fill you up for the fewest number of calories. You also want to make sure that you have some protein in there because fiber and protein are, are two of the things that help you feel full. 
And what about portion sizes? I've heard that, you know, that plate that I could eat when I was in my 30s and not gain weight, now I eat that same plate and I gain weight because I can't burn all those calories. How do we control portion sizes? What should we be looking to do? So you should definitely have your plate filled with a lot of foods that have volume, but not a ton of calories. So if you're looking to decrease the calories that you eat, you don't want to necessarily want to decrease the volume. So you might have more vegetables on your plate and a smaller portion of mashed potatoes and a smaller portion of meat. Um, but you still want to have that same volume, otherwise you're going to feel not very satisfied and you might have some, some pangs of hunger. I want to ask you about intermittent fasting because that's very trendy right now. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me your thoughts on intermittent fasting. We talk about all of these different diets sometimes as the diet wars because there's always a new diet and it's being compared against the other diet, which one's better in these head-to-head -head comparisons. But what we generally know is that a caloric deficit is important. So eating fewer calories is important. And however you do that, it works in terms of weight loss. So you can restrict the times of day that you eat calories, which is some of the approaches for intermittent fasting. You can restrict the number of days a week that you're, you're fasting. That's another type of intermittent fasting. Or you can fo focus more on different nutrients. So diets that are focused on protein or carbs or fat. And, but all of those approaches have the same thing in common, which is the caloric deficit. Speaking of that, there must be thousands of diets out there and new ones pop up every week. How do, how do you know what diet is going to work for you? It's important to think about what your personal preferences are. So I don't tend to love meat. So a, f a diet that really focused on a lot of protein would not work very well for me. I tend to be more of enjoying the vegetables, so a more veg vegetable-focused diet might work really well for me. But if someone else is more of a meat and potatoes kind of person, then a different diet might work for that person. So I think you need to think about your own preferences of, am I the kind of person that gets really hangry and I need to eat <laughs> all the time? Well, intermittent fasting might not be the best choice for It might not work for you, yeah. that's right. And I think also, um, to be very aware of the things that may motivate you. Um, you know, maybe you notice somebody saying something um, from some certain diet, maybe it's the intermittent fasting, where it's like, oh, I can do that. And that's easy for you. Maybe at that time, that's something that you needed to hear, and then that's that's what motivates you, and that's what's appealing to you at that moment. It just, it's like it what may you be just something, said about exercise. Yes. Mm -hmm. Choose may, something yep. that you will yep. do. Right. Uh, and be aware of that and notice that and don't just let it slide by. <laughs> now we talked about diet and exercise, but they do work together, don't they? Mm -hmm. um, can you lose weight by just through diet or just through exercise or is it best to, best to combine them? Well, I would say it's certainly best to combine them. Can you lose weight through just diet? Absolutely. Can you lose weight through just exercise? It's harder. Um, but you could probably do that. That's a lot of exercise. <laughs> Depends on how much you're eating. But um, obviously the best approach is going to be to combine them because you're going back to that net caloric deficit. And to get that, that number of calories down, if I decrease my intake by two or 300 calories, that's not extreme. I can do that. You know, you don't eat one dessert or something. And then I increase my expenditure by two or 300 calories, that's you know, a 30, 40, 50 minute walk. Those are doable things. So by combining those, I get a bigger bang for my buck. Well, let's close out with best advice. What's your best advice to help us lose weight that we gain in our 50s, 60s and beyond? Figure out how to enjoy it. Don't do things that you feel like are a burden, that are deprivation. Figure out a way of eating that is healthful and a way that of exercising that is healthful that doesn't feel like a burden. And Barbara, how are you? And I think is to maybe um, make sure that you educate yourself on best practices and work with someone um, that's knowledgeable so that you're using your time most effectively. 
for instance, if we're going to build muscle mass, I need to be lifting weights. It's hard. It's harder for older people to, to build muscle mass. So I need to make sure that what I'm doing in my time is the most effective way to do it. Well, thank you both for being on The Best Times and talking about how we can lose weight as we age. Thank sure. you. Want more information about life after 50? Go online to watch more shows and find more resources. And send us your feedback and story ideas to besttimes at wkno.org. That's all for this edition of The Best Times. Please join us next week for more stories about life after 50. Until then, I'm Chris Hardaway. Thanks for watching. Good night. Funding for The Best Times is provided by the Plow Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you.